In previous videos, we've studied Poisson regression, and in this video I want to take a look at how we would implement Poisson regression in R. And we'll do that using this Galapagos Islands data set. And this data set was uh, studied, at least in our textbook, we may have used it in class as uh, a data set that we could try to, to apply linear regression to. And we're going to see in this example why that's not such a great idea. Another solution that might help analyze this data with uh, normal linear regression and then how a generalized linear model like Poisson regression could you know potentially be better. So here I'm just reading in the data and um, giving a, a short printout of the beginning just so you can see uh, what the variables are. And really the goal here is for us to model the number of species of a particular plant found on an island. These are islands in Galapagos. And maybe using some of these as predictors. So for example, we're going to leave out endemics, but we're going to potentially use area, so the area of the particular island. Um, elevation, so the highest elevation of the island. Uh, the distance from the nearest island and etc. So the distance from the Santa Cruz Island uh, you know turns out to be an important predictor and the area of the adjacent island. So all of these things are thought to have some uh, you know predictive power on how many sp species of this plant exist on a particular island. So the first thing that I ask you to do is to fit a linear model with species as the response and all other variables as the predictor except for the endemics variable. And so I do that in this code here. And I plot um, one of our diagnostic plots to see whether we think we have a good fit to this model. So let's take a look at that plot. Here it is, we have our residuals along the uh, vertical axis and the fitted values along the horizontal axis and we can see that this doesn't look like a, a great plot this is not what we would expect to see if the model fit well right we have a pretty clear downward trend uh, in the residuals when that shouldn't be the case if the model fit well we should see more of a cloud of points and uh, we also see that there seems to be a bit of a lower variance here than out here, right? There, as the fitted values get larger, the variability in the, uh, the residuals gets larger. So that seems to uh, be problematic on two accounts, right? There's some structural issues with the model. We're seeing a trend. And there's also some issue in um, non-constant variance. So if we didn't have the tools of a generalized linear model at our disposal, we could try a transformation of the response. And in this course, we didn't cover transformations too much, but I did give you a homework assignment where you um, played around with a few different transformations and saw that it could help with certain violations. And so in this case, we might try a square root transformation on the response to see if that helps us with the non-constant variance assumption. And so that's what I do here, just take the square root of the response and then regress against each of the predictors. And again, let's plot our residuals versus fitted values. And we notice that things look quite a bit better, right? There's not a clear trend in these um, residuals, and it also doesn't seem like there's a, um, a clear, say, smaller variability here versus larger variability here. It seems to have controlled for both of those uh, issues. But the problem with this uh, transformation is that it makes the interpretability of the regression model more difficult. Right Now things are interpreted in terms of changes in the square root number of species on an island rather than just the number of species on the island. So it is possible to work with this model, but it might not be ideal because of the, the interpretation issues. So part C uh, acknowledges these transformation issue issues and suggests that maybe we should try a Poisson regression model. And the clue as to why we should try a Poisson model 
is that the response is a count, right? It's the number of species. And we know that there is a normal approximation to the Poisson distribution, and so that's why a normal model might be reasonable, especially if we do some sort of transformation. But if the original um, response is a Poisson is Poisson distributed, then we might uh, consider using that type of model. So here is the way we fit the Poisson model. It's very similar to the binomial model. We use the GLM function and same formula, right? Species as the response. Uh, this dot gives you all of the other values as predictors. Specify the data set and then uh, specify the family as the Poisson distribution. And this tells R to use the canonical link function, which is the log link for the Poisson. And so here we get a summary of, the, uh, of that model. And uh, I also give the same plot. So here, this is a plot of the predicted values. So those are the fitted values along the uh, x-axis and the standardized residuals along the y-axis. And notice here that for the predicted values of a generalized linear model, it's important to specify the type that you want to come out of this function. And we mentioned this in a previous video. Uh, there are different types. You could have it on the scale of the linear predictor. That's what the link type does. But you could also specify this on the scale of the, the mean, right? The scale of the rate parameter. And so if you wanted to do that, you would specify here uh, response, and that would give you things on the scale of the response. But it's usually better, so we mentioned this in a previous video, it's usually better to uh, make construct this plot using the scale of the linear predictor. It just has things um, a, a bit more spread out and easier to interpret. So if we take a look quickly at the summary of this Poisson regression model, we notice we have some summary statistics for the deviance residuals. So we defined the deviance residuals in a previous video and estimates of our parameters of the model. So these estimates are of the betas and they are not exponentiated. So if you do want to interpret uh, these values as uh, you know changes in the mean of the response, you would have to exponentiate them. So the interpretation of the remaining columns here are similar to linear regression. It's just that the theory underlying how we get these values is a bit different. So as was true with binomial regression, you see z values here rather than the t values that you saw for linear regression. And the reason for that is, remember, we're using maximum likelihood estimation. And the way that we get uh, tests and confidence intervals for maximum likelihood estimation is to use some asymptotic theory about MLEs. And that theory says that the maximum likelihood estimators um, you know, from which these values come are asymptotically normal. So in the limit as the number of data points goes to infinity, uh, we have asymptotic normality, and that's where we get these tests from. So they're not always terribly accurate when you don't have a large, uh, you know, large number of data points. And so we might, you know, take these these values with a grain of salt. So notice towards the bottom here we have the null deviance and the residual deviance, and we discussed how we derive both of these deviances uh, in a previous video and down below we'll look at how to use these to assess uh, goodness of fit. And then the AIC statistic is helpful in model selection and time permitting in this course in the last unit we will look at uh, model selection and AIC will, will play a role there. So for now we'll ignore it but hopefully we'll get back to it towards the end of the semester. All right, so let's take a look at uh, a plot of the standardized residuals against the fitted values for this model. And again, the fitted values are on the scale of the linear predictor here. 
and I encourage you to change that and see you know what happens to the scale of the plot but here we notice things don't look too bad um, you know maybe there's uh, it, there doesn't seem to be a trend it does seem to be that there's like a bit of clumping here so lower uh, variability may be towards the middle with slightly higher towards the ends but that is not too prominent um, and you know this this plot doesn't look too bad in terms of diagnosing uh, you know issues with the model so we seem to do pretty well certainly better than the original linear model and um, the nice thing about this one is that we didn't have to do a square root transformation, so we can think about uh, interpretations of the of the estimates. So that's what I have us do in part D. So I asked to interpret the parameter associated with the nearest predictor. So if we go back up to the summary, notice here we have this predictor nearest. And so this value is on the scale of the linear predictor and if we hope to so that would be on the scale of the log of the mean of the response and if we hope to interpret it in terms of the mean of the response itself we have to exponentiate so that's what we do here um, so I exponentiate and we get something just slightly bigger than one and this tells us that if our model is correct a one unit increase in nearest is associated with a multiplicative increase of uh, approximately 1.01 .01 in species on average and adjusting for the other predictors. Right, so notice it's a multiplicative increase that comes out of um, the interpretation video that I, I posted last week. Um, and on average is important, right? This is telling us something about the average response. And of course, adjusting for other predictors. Whenever we have several predictors, we have an additive model like this. Um, we are uh, basically adjusting for those others. We're keeping those constant and thinking about a one unit increase in the, in the predictor in question. For the last part of, the, of this question, I ask us to calculate the deviance for Poisson regression and ask uh, if, if this value shows up in the summary. Well, it does. It should look familiar down there. And I also, also ask to check the goodness of fit of this model using Pearson's chi-squared statistic. So we've had videos on both uh, the deviance and Pearson's chi-squared. So let's just use those formulas to calculate these things and show that well, at least the residual deviance matches above. So this formula should look familiar based on a previous video. This is just the residual deviance that we, uh, we derived. And printing it out here gives us this 716 value. And if we go back up to our summary, notice that you have exactly that up here. So we've correctly calculated the residual deviance. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to calculate the null deviance, but that should be pretty simple based on what we've discussed in previous videos. And you know, you should know that what the hypotheses are that could be tested based on these residual deviances and null deviances. Those were covered in a in previous video, so make sure that you're you're aware of those things if I were to ask you about them. So in this case, I ask you to check the goodness of fit of this model using Pearson's chi-squared statistic, and I ask you what to conclude about the fit. So here I'm calculating the Pearson chi-squared uh, statistic, and remember that is the response minus the fitted value. Square that, uh, divide by the fitted value and then sum over all of those values. So here we get the Pearson's chi-squared statistic. It shouldn't be uh, very surprising that this statistic is very close to the deviance. Right, those things should be relatively close to each other. Um, and so that shouldn't be surprising. And then I, I use the fact that the chi-squared the Pearson's chi-squared test statistic 
will have a particular distribution, a chi-squared distribution with n minus p plus 1 degrees of freedom, where in this case uh, I take this 24 from up above here, and so we're on 24 degrees of freedom. There were uh, 30 measurements, and then there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, predictor values plus an intercept, so that's six parameters that we're estimating. So we've got 30 measurements minus six parameters, 24 degrees of freedom. And so when we calculate the p-value, remember we're looking for area above the uh, value that we actually calculated. Um, so larger chi-squared values uh, are problematic. And we notice that the p-value is I mean, it's not exactly zero, but it's effectively zero. It's being rounded to zero. So that tells us that uh, the, the fit, at least according to this metric, uh, is not great. So recall the test statistics, uh, sorry, recall the hypotheses being tested here. The null hypothesis is that the model fits the data really well. And the alternative would be that the fit is not quite right and we need to for example take into account other predictors and so according to this chi-squared test we have uh, a rejection of the null hypothesis that the model fits the data and we might want to go and search for some other predictors that can can better fit now you might also think about assessing models according to uh, something like the predicted MSC, the mean squared error, which we've looked at for linear regression models in the past, and I have you do this on the next homework assignment. So it's also important to think about how well a model predicts rather than just fits according to these statistics. And so as an exercise for you, you might check what is the predicted MSC for this model and how might it compare to, for example, the linear models that we fit above.